Greetings, Gigabytes. This is Matt Hair Patrick. Okay, chair check, mouse check, keyboard check, and monitor check. Okay, it looks like I'm ready to review more computer games. That's right, I'm back to looking over some classic and recent CD-ROM games or classic games that eventually got poured into today's technology. There is usually something unique or mesmerizing about these games from the past and to figure out which ones hold up well and which ones do not. Same rules as before, no lower grades. These are just my personal opinions. And I'm just going to look over some selected games at random from one development at a time. So let's get the random OMAG activated! Welcome to another episode of The Wonder Reviews. We made it through the night as well as reached the Daybreak of Dawn, but now it's time for the Day of the Computer Games! parents and teachers told you to read a book so you can take down some aliens from space? Even if they didn't, this is one way to catch up on reading. Commonly known as Reading Galaxy, Alien Tales is a trivia-like game show where you have to answer questions about popular novels by famous authors. You pick an alien like in Hollywood Squares and they will talk about the book that they claim they wrote. Yeah, we have a war with that back on Earth. It's called stealing. You calling me a fake? Well then, let's see if you're a flake. There are three rounds you have to go through. In the first round, you have to reveal the picture from the novel by completing one of the two challenges. There's to tell the truth, but you have to guess that the alien statement about the book's summary is true or false. Get it right, you get to move the pieces in the correct spot. And in Gamity Square, you pick a square and answer the question about the book from three choices. If you get four in a row, like in Connect Four or Tic Tac Toe, the picture will be revealed and you advance to the next round, Beat the Croc. In this parody of Beat the Clock, you have to solve some crossword puzzles by guessing the question from the book and spell it correctly. Once you get the right answer, you will receive a letter and the picture will appear a bit. But your job is to solve the puzzle by figuring out what is wrong with the picture Wheel of Fortune style before time runs out. After completing the two rounds, the book will change to have the real author's name on the front cover, and you enter the Solar Lightning round, a bonus round where you had to play either Stump the Human or Meteor Match. In Stump the Human, you had to figure out what's wrong with the picture again, but this time you had to pick a letter carefully just like in Wheel of Fortune. If you want to win a letter, you had to answer a question about the author of the book. And in Meteor Match, you had to match the following columns that's accurate to the author's biography to reveal the picture a bit and figure out what's wrong with it. I do like the idea that this show is parenting classic game shows, and some of the books they choose are perfect, and I like the illustrations of them such as The Wizard of Oz, Matilda, Alice in Wonderland, and more. And best of all, if you haven't read any of these books nor know anything about the real author, there are some text passages that can help you find the answer. But what makes Alien Tales entertaining are the aliens themselves. These things are really out of this world. I remember this bird-like creature who claimed she wrote Alice in Wonderland, and now that I'm older, I'm starting to think that they may be a missing resident of Wonderland itself. I just flew in from Deval, and boy are my arms tired! By a boom! Wait! I don't have any arms! When did that happen? My personal favorite moment is when they eliminate the aliens for losing the game, and that's only because they lie about being the real authors. And much like most game shows, you win money and prizes as well as restoring the book respectfully. But the money is basically alien currency called Starbucks, and the prize you get from Beat the Croc is a new rank for winning the games and some other fictional prizes. Though it is sad that all the stuff you just won from the game never got delivered to Earth. Imagine if you waited years for that futuristic computer or golden gift card. Hello, is this the Aliens Network? I was supposed to receive your prizes for beating your game. When am I supposed to get my new computer, poster, and spaceship? I don't know who you are! Stop calling me! A fun reading adventure filled with kooky aliens. If you want to test your reading knowledge, then try auditioning for Alien Tales, coming soon to a galaxy near you. Before Mr. Potato Head became one of the stars of a computer anime feature, there was a time that he had his own games made by Hasbro, an activity game, and Mr. Potato Head saves Veggie Valley. The plot is that Veggie Valley is in need of water to grow the potato kids, so Mr. Potato Head and his daughter Sweet Potato go to the carnival to snatch a grumpy old rain cloud, but they had to collect some things in order to bring the cloud back to the valley. If there's one thing everyone remembers Mr. Potato Head so dearly, is that you're supposed to dress him up into something silly. 
And there are some occasional moments where you have to decorate him and sweet potato, like a faux boob getting past a veggie troll, and yes, if you dress up like a clown or a pig, you can enter the carnival for free, even though admission is 5 cents each and nobody brought money for the journey. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not how free admission works. Come on, you gotta let me in. I'm the cat in the hat. You have a Dr. Seuss land in your theme park. Buddy, you don't work for us, and you're not even a real cat. But I also have Harry Potter. <laughs> Wait, what were they supposed to do again? You were just about to buy our tickets. Oh, yeah. I'll give credit that the colors are nice to look at, from the designs of the veggies to some of the backgrounds in Veggie Valley and the carnival. But the carnival games aren't really that amazing since it's just a straightforward pinball game and fish matching. And there's a pointless contest that if you finish eating the pies, you get to keep the tins as prizes. What do we win, Head of Lettuce? Why, the pie tins, of course! <laughs> At the end of the day, it's a decent game based on a toy line. The potato head accessory is fun to dress, the visuals are nice and colorful, and even some of the puzzle solving and critical thinking is pretty good as well. But the gameplay is pretty much straightforward and there's barely a handful of fun side quests. It's a good game for kids and only they can take the potato head venture seriously. Unless they do a crossover with VeggieTales, Veggie Valley is something that I don't see myself visiting again anytime soon. a lot of Reader Rabbit games, but I do recall being one of the most recognizable edutainment games next to Jumpstart and Map Blasters. Some of his adventures were point and click, while others were just a series of mini games. Reader Rabbit and his friends are playing a surprise birthday party for their friend Sam the Lion, so they had to get things ready like making presents, making sweets, and putting up decorations. I think the best thing about the computer game is not really the characters or the educational value, it's when Reader says your name at the main hub of the game. Nice to see you again. Patrick? It may not sound much, but for a 1999 game, that's an innovation. This was around the decade that E.T. says your name at Universal Studios. Now for the gameplay, I think the learning company did a good job on the actual thinking games. The goal is to have 18 themes from each minigame, 3 sets of 6. For example, you have 6 different gifts to wrap up for each round. You move up to level 2 and start working on the next set. The games don't actually repeat the same mechanics as the others, like in Pierre's house, there's one you had to mix and match the decorations with a different color, shape, or pattern, and in the other minigame you had to find the right color using the colors that have been already been painted as clues. Other games include matching toys in the diagram category, or sorting and matching toys and treats, and the higher the difficulty, the trickier it gets for most of the games. Like in the mice dancing one, you had to remember the order from one mouse by memory. There's also one that you had to navigate Matt the Mouse to pin the tail on the donkey, or you had to figure out what icing you have to ice over next in the cookie challenge. And already after seeing those big things, it makes me hungry for some. Oh, Sam loves cookies. <gasps> He'll be so excited to see these. I also like it goes to a cutscene of the surprise party showing how close you are on finishing the game. However, there aren't that many fun clicks in the game, with the exception of the other animal characters, and they go all out singing some party songs. It's a charming reader rabbit game, but at the same time, it's an entertainment game that's full of surprises. <laughs> well, this is the closest we'll get for an Evan Mickey remake. Bendy and the Ink Machine was an epic side horror game created by a person nicknamed The Meatly. When the first chapter was released, it immediately received a massive following, and as the month passed, it grew larger with the chapters with new enhanced updates. It was during the trend of Five Nights at Freddy's where they seemingly take a childhood character and turn into a nightmarish monster. But when this fad occurred, I wasn't a fan of it. I don't like jump scare. That's why I never play Five Nights at Freddy's and Telltale, and possibly never will. But Bendy was a much different horror game than those other games. There are still plenty of jump scares, and they are effective, but the playthrough is what separates it from the others, where for now, it's about surviving the night based on luck and strategy, but Bendy and the Ink Machine relies on puzzle solving and combat with a touch of luck. When it comes to the story, this is an interesting take. You play a cartoonist named Henry, who is supposed to meet the creator of Bendy and founder of the studio, Joey Drew. When he activated the Ink Machine, he released the monster version of the tune and fell down the deepest realm of the workshop filled with lost ink souls, and other strange resident mall after the characters from the cartoon. Everything about this game's world building is like someone trying to depict the dark side of Disney, and the characters they are supposed to model look something out of a silly symphony short. 
Plus, imagine to flesh out the characters who used to work for Joey Drew and question whether or not he is a nice person depending on what's happening behind the scenes. Rather be casting someone building a bendy theme park or been filed for bankruptcy. One of the best examples is Alice Angel from the third chapter. If you listen to some of the audio footage, she was the original voice actor to her respected character until she was replaced. And now she's one of the antagonists that succumbed to the ink and only wants to be beautiful. He could have touched me. He could have pulled me back. Do you know what it's like living in the dark puddles? But that's not all. The workshop contained a lot of mystery about Henry's purpose, Boris Wolf being cloned or ripped apart, and who exactly is Joey Drew? The visuals are incredible to look at. Of course, this is not a colorful game. But the color schemes like black, white, brown, and yellow use it to its advantage to make it look like a vintage cartoon. And making each area of the studio massive on the inside like Alice in Angel's Lair, Bendy Land, The Music Room, and more. The story is surrealistically intriguing, the designs are amazing, the characters are memorable. You will believe Bendy and the Ink Machine is a frighteningly fun video game. It's what made it succeed, rich, and powerful enough to get a sequel. Now that is positively a silly thought. Ah, uh, my favorite part of the computer games review, talking about humongous entertainment games. These were hands down the best point and click adventures of all time. They were imaginative, entertaining, and wholesome. All of which you can still find in games like Pajama Sam. The series is about a boy named Sam whose favorite comic book hero is Pajama Man. And he goes on creative adventures as Pajama Sam. The whole point of this humongous series is to help kids how to face their fears. And in Pajama Sam's first adventure, No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside, he went on a heroic mission to defeat darkness. You see, Sam can't sleep because it's the first time he's going to bed with the lights off, and he believes Darkness, the comic book supervillain, is living inside his closet, so he decides to capture Darkness by using his flashlight and trap him in his Pajama Man lunchbox. But when he enters the closet, it turns out to be an otherworld realm known as the Land of Darkness. And everything about the place is just beautiful. The docks contain the relaxing rivers and a cool underground cavern. The mines are like the best roller coaster in the world filled with red lava and gold. And Darkness' house is basically a super fun house containing dancing furniture, a trivia game show, twisted doorways, and a bunch of kitchen appliances singing. Although shortly I'll be chewed, nevertheless I must conclude. Just like any other humongous entertainment game, it does involve puzzle solving by using items you found in the Lane of Darkness. Once Pajama Sam enters the world, a bunch of rotten trees stole his lunchbox, flashlight, and Pajama Sam Mac and scattered them all over the land, and you had to find them before he confronts darkness. The playthrough does vary to make the experience both exciting and challenging. In one playthrough, you had to get the mask back by helping the carer free the other carers at the kitchen, but in another playthrough, you had to figure out a way to get the mask out of the furniture room without being seen. But there are some additional minigames and side quests you can do. There are socks hidden throughout the game, and you have to find 10 pairs of them to wash them. At the mines, there's an arcane game where you have to collect minerals without crashing anything, including yourself. At the boat docks, you can play cheese and crackers against a toaster, which is the world's version of tic-tac-toe. And there's a science lab where if you follow the recipe exactly, you get a crazy surprise. Whoa! It also helps that this entire gameplay is part of Pajama Sam's imagination. Think about it. If he ever wants to face Darkness and defeat him, what will he do? Well, at the end of the game, Darkness is nothing like the comic book supervillain. He's just a lighthearted, shallow like person that's all alone that wants someone to play with. Which is a good lesson that Darkness isn't scary all the time. In fact, if you play continuously, the Darkness can show some wondrous things at night, like the stars, shining light, or at times show something beautiful inside dark places like crystals and geysers in the dark caverns or the golden mines. If you ever want to play a game where imagination runs wild, have no fear because Pajama Sam is here. Okay, darkness, watch out! Your specimen has been processed, and we are now ready to begin the test proper. Now this is a super cool and even educational video game. You play a subject named Chell who is forced to do some tests using a portal gun by orders of a robot named GLaDOS. If she completes all of them, she wins a cake, but in true, GLaDOS wants to kill Chell and release a thousand memes from the oven. The game starts off as a freeware app called Norbacular Drop made at DigiPen Institute of Technology. When Valve saw the student project, they offered the team behind the game some jobs to expand upon it. 
and with it came more portal puzzles. However, Portal did have some educational aspect for its critical thinking and problem solving in a satirical storyline. The rules of the games are rather simple. You get a portal gun that shoots blue and orange, and you have to aim at a specific area as long as it's solid at a stone wall. It can be used easily to drop or shoot items towards buttons to activate things. The same thing applies to Android to avoid getting shot. There are other power-ups as well, like a companion cube, and best of all, if you have a hard time maneuvering the portal, the settings allow you to adjust it to blast the portals easily. As a puzzle-solving video game, it takes a lot of thinking to figure out how to advance to the next level. Sometimes you need to think outside the box, like finding the highest stone wall above your head, or take a leap of faith down a portal and jump from a sideway portal to reach the other side of the level. But the more you continue your journey on finding the way out, the more you learn the secrets of the Aperture Science Center. While GLaDOS would be known for her updated appearance in the sequel, she is a famous video game villain for her sketchy computer voice, and she's a good singer too at the end credits. But the way she toys with Chell and tries to give her some information of where Chell come from, you never know if she's telling the truth or she's just lying to mess with her and get an opening shot to kill her. We can no longer lie to you. When the testing is over, you will be missed. And when you finally reach GLaDOS, well you can easily defeat her by knocking out her core pieces and dump them in the incinerator. However, you had to do it fast because the boss battle is under a 6 minute time limit. The gameplay is awesome, the villain's intimidating and cool, and the story is complex. And that's why Portal ended up being a successful experiment. <laughs> it's the Bear's turn for Interactive Storytime. The Bear's name bears like Dr. Seuss and Arthur are phenomenal children's books about a bear family dealing with everyday life with good morals. The book series is well known by older people that it's the subject of the Mandela Effect. It's when someone just remembers a significant piece of memory from their childhood, otherwise known as a false memory. Back then, people thought Berenstain was spelled Berenstain with an E, but it's actually Stain with an A, much like the author's last names. Other examples include movie quotes and character looks. In Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, while well, something Dark Vader said, Luke, I am your father, he actually said, No, I am your father. And on Pokemon, people thought Pikachu had a black tip on his yellow tail, but no, Pikachu's tail is fully yellow. The list goes on with stuff like Snow White, Forrest Gump, C-3PO, Curious George, the Looney Tunes, and more. I thought I could bring this up because it does somewhat fit the idea of this bear story, In the Dark. Brother Bear checks out a scary mystery book called The Case of the Crying Cave. When he reads it to sister and starts scaring her, she gets afraid of the dark and none of the bears can sleep with the lights on. So the bears try to help her get over her fear and learn that being afraid of the dark is just part of her imagination. I do like the mention in this story, like Pajama Sand, there are some good things to like about the dark, like the scenes with the pond and fireflies. And that imagination can have its ups and downs if you don't let it carry you away based on sounds and imagery. There's a page where we see all the things bump in the night. We're never sure if these were part of Sister's imagination or just part of a point and click. You do see how she sees things in the dark after the mystery book. When she goes to the attic, she does learn imagination can bring joy on stuff like she likes painting or poetry and figure out if every scary thing she sees or hears is real or not. The best parts of the living book games are the visuals and clicking on some stuff. Bear country is beautiful from the landscape to the adorable designs of the bears themselves. There is a firefly that's like the running gag of the interactive page, but I barely remember its moments. My favorite moment is when some character either play some music or sing a song. Well, I was born in this water hole. Whoa, look out! There's gonna be a sing out between him and Frankie from Meet the Robinsons. There was a mini game on matching creatures in the dark, but that's all there is to it. And the jungle picture game is where it changes night and day for each level. Forget that! I wanna click on the story for some funny gags. George Michel. Ugh, yuck! A good story message with some funny jokes, this interactive classic game shows that the Berenstain Bears are just like any other happy family. How do I look? <laughs> now you're scaring me, Papa! Kermit the Frog here with my friend Gonzo. Arriba! While we remember Muppet Babies in both the original and the reboot cartoon, there was a period of time when the Muppets had educational games as the Muppet Kids based on the books from the 1990s. Especially a brain teaser game for like matching and sorting stuff in the correct order. And that's pretty much it and what you can get. It's a game that anyone can finish in less than a half hour. 
Not much story is in this one. Well, there is a bit. In the live action bit, it has Gonzo riding a crazy rocket. There was a party storyline going on in the last levels, however, there's no actual plot of the game. The reason why The Muppet Babies was a phenomenal cartoon is because it still had the Muppet charm and comedy we love from the Jim Henson show and let their imagination run wild like starring in movies, going to the world's biggest theme park, or meeting some strange characters that are creative as the Muppets. The purpose of Muppet thinking skills is simply help Kermit, Fozzie, Piggy, and the rest with their activities. It was nice for a while just to see the Muppets, the settings and designs look adorable, but the best moments in the game are really the bits with Kermit and Gonzo. They're the only ones that present the Muppet comedy goal we remember. I'm attempting to land just as the music reaches its dramatic conclusion. I guess for a thinking game, it is good to tease kids like figuring out which gingerbread cookie animal wants, sorting Fozzie's blocks, matching the shapes with Piggy, and more. The Muppet Kids is a harmless series meant to teach simple problem solving. An instant decent game, just not a sensational, inspirational, or celebrational one. SpongeBob's earliest game made by THQ, short for Toy Headquarters. Mr. Krabs gives SpongeBob and Patrick tickets to Neptune's Paradise, and the goal is to simply figure out how to get to the plate by solving puzzles, talking to some people, and visiting other areas in Bikini Bottom, Rock Bottom, and Bottoms Up. We all know SpongeBob is an easily marketable Nickelodeon character, but in terms of gaming, he's doing a pretty good job at it, like Battle for Bikini Bottom, his movie game adaptation, and Cosmic Shake. And I think his adventure game does apply to the ones I mentioned before. There are a few issues with it though, like the cinematic cutscenes are ugly to look at because of the rendering. It's like they're trying to make another Spongebob meme, but they can't figure out which one to use. Wanna hear the most annoying sound in the whole sea? Yeah, that is pretty annoying. Are the cutscenes trying to be Spongebob Chicken, or are they trying to become neighbors with Bold and Brash? But when you get to the gameplay, the 3 of the characters are actually pretty good. Another reason why the game is good is to explore parts of the underworld world and meet some unique characters. There's a five-star restaurant with a funny slogan. Sublime seafood tastes like chicken. Nice slogan. A wizard named Marlin that controlled the weather but has a bad memory. A trippy dream sequence where Spongebob looks like Squidward. And possibly the smartest running gag in the game is that Spongebob meets this familiar character in each chapter, yet he doesn't remember him at all. I won't give away the punchline, but let's just say they found a way to reuse his asset in a crazy way. Yeah, that's probably it, Spongebob. How did you know my name? Er, um, you just, uh, you look like a Spongebob, that's all. The game also contained plenty of references from the show, like a whole chapter exploring Rock Bottom, Spongebob's grandma makes another appearance after the Grandma Kisses episode. He even kept the Nasty Patty from the same name episode. Spongebob's Employing the Monkey is a fun point-and-click adventure that has enough laughs and visuals to keep it amusing. This is the nautical nonsense that any Spongebob fan wish. Together, we can accomplish anything! Sorry for the wait. Oh, now this is a classic point-and-click adventure. Grim Fandango. Fandango! No, not that Fandango. This computer game is a film noir that the Grim Reaper named Manny is a travel agent for Lost Souls. His job is to give deceased visitors luxurious travels in the afterlife, but he ends up getting some poor clients that have no hearts back in the day of the living. When he picked up a purely nice woman named Michi, he still couldn't get her a well appointed offer to number 9 because something or someone is messing with the system. So Manny has to stop this evil crime overlord that kidnapped Michi and rigging everything so the innocents can board the train to the Knife Underworld, the happiest place there is in the afterlife. There are so many things to love about this game. The world building is extraordinary like having Demon as extra helpers and the Grim Reaper investing in travel agency during the Day of the Dead. There's even a clever twist that any skeleton person can still die permanently even if they're already dead. It's when Hector or any of his associates has this gun that shoots flower pellets and the flower sprouts all over the body. Lola! Lola! It's like watching a Halloween version of Casablanca and North by Northwest. The puzzle solving does get difficult from time to time, but you're still fascinated about the animation and the characters and the world they live in. Including Manny trying to earn his place in the great beyond, Glodin is the cartoony demon that loves to drive, and Domino being the Gaston type antagonist that gets better clients with some help from the crime lord Hector. Many of the backgrounds are incredible to look at like Manny's Casino, the Underwater Prison, and of course the Living World. 
which is an interesting contrast where the dead use their afterlife as normal, but the living looks like someone tried to make an obscure Picasso artwork by using cut-out magazines. It may be the land of the dead, but Grim Fandango is an underrated computer game that's full of life. Okay everyone, that's it for this year's Computer Games Compilation Review. Thank you so much for watching and joining me on this alphanumeric journey. From the good to the bad to the silliest computer games ever imagined. Did you have fun with any of these games back then? Are there any other retro or recent computer games that are worth remembering? Well, feel free to leave in the comments below and explain why they're your favorites. For now, it's time to give the computer a good night rest. I'm Matt Harapatrick, now if you'll excuse me, I'm going to the store to get a cake. Uh, hello? I'm here to pick up my order. Of course, but first, stand still while we take your picture to remember you. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this, check out these other videos, or feel free to like, comment, and subscribe for more upcoming reviews and other projects. I'll see you soon.